Hello everyone, this is Rod from the Alchemist Den, our esoteric and hermetic study society. Welcome back to the channel and today we will be uh, talking about witches and witchcraft. Is it a spiritual path? Is it like practical sorcery? Um, what is the relation between witchcraft and paganism? And um, also we'd like to discuss about uh, the, the difference between high magic, learned magic and folk magic, which is more associated to uh, the practice of, of witchcraft. And finally, uh, we'll discuss a little bit about the difference between the Northern uh, European tradition and the Southern European tradition, although they have very similar evolution, but they have different influences to it. The discussion, of course, will be related to the European witchcraft tradition in general. I'm not going to talk about um, African or, or Asian other kind of witchcraft because that would be really too wide of a discussion. So we will be focusing on uh, um, the European witchcraft tradition. And um, talking about witch or witches, I think the first problem or the first uh, issue that I actually stumbled across trying to put this discussion together was actually the definition of witch. Uh, we know that historically uh, a witch has a very negative connotation to this term. Um, essentially it was somebody that um, uses supernatural or occult forces to uh, damage somebody, some property or something. Although uh, nowadays this term is practically and radically changing, uh, embracing more related, more um, is expanded to paganism, is expanding to uh, using the occult, using supernatural uh, forces, not only for damage, but also for healing or for other positive uh, things. So the term of which within the occult is uh, basically changing, nevertheless, uh, trying to give it a, an appropriate uh, definition still pretty and hard work and um, I think the best maybe to start from the very beginning and we'll start from the very famous uh, sentence in the Bible in the Exodus the um, 22 to 18th the very famous sentence that in English reads or is translated into thou shall not suffer a witch to live and this sentence became the flag of the uh, Inquisition. It became the flag of the witch hunt of the Middle Age. And um, funny enough that this uh, translation as one of the many um, is an example of really a lost in translation. Because the word witch that is used in this sentence in, in Hebrew was actually indicated as Mekashefa. And Mekashefa is a little bit far from what we would think of a definition of a witch. Amika Shepa was like a um, herbalist, uh, somebody expert in potions, in herbs, minerals. Uh, yes, there is some kind of sources uh, related to it, but not necessarily a, a witch in the term that we would uh, consider it today. And Amika Shepa, um, when, it went, when it got translated into Greek, uh, the most, the proper word to translate Mekashefa is pharmakeia. And again, pharmakeia is pretty much close to the real meaning of Mekashefa. So it's, we're still talking about a herbalist, we're still, still talking about somebody uh, that is uh, using natural forces, natural um, means to uh, cure or, or to, of course, to produce some kind of, of damages as well. Pharmakeia were also poisoners. And in Greek, actually, within the world of the occult, there were, they, they, they were very specific segregation for uh, the terms and the people uh, related to the occult. Like, for instance, this pharmakeia or pharmakeus for, for, for men um, is related to, to herbs and potions. And then we had other uh, meaning much more positive, like uh, we have the Theopropia or the Mantosini, which were uh, the high priestesses of temple, like for instance, the temple of, uh, of Apollo, the famous oracle of Delphi. Uh, the uh, Theopropia were um, high priestesses receiving the uh, oracle from, from the god. So mainly some kind of divination. And then we have other terms like uh, goes or goeres, 
which is the root word from the uh, Goetia today, and is mainly associated with black magic, although personally speaking, and not only me, other other people uh, would associate with Goetis to a uh, shaman as well. So not only with a dark, like double in the dark art kind of meaning, but also uh, shamanic tradition. And then we had the Magoi. The Magoi, they were like the Persian, um, the followers of the Zoroastrian religion. Uh, this priest ex expert in ceremonies, mainly um, priest and uh, yeah, expert in rituals. And then finally we had the, the Muste or the Mistai, um, the initiated into some kind of um, mystery cult. These were mm, like Eleusinian, like uh, Isis and Osiris, we had the uh, Mitras cult, and more than often people were initiated in more than one mystery cult. So back to our um, pharmakeia. The pharmakeia, uh, or pharmakeos, as I say, for, for, for men, uh, we had the two most uh, famous examples of pharmakeia, uh, that are uh, Media and Circe. Although these two ladies were not completely human, because they claimed to have a divine um, genealogy. Um, Media comes in the story of the Orgonauts, uh, she's in the Theogony of Hesiod, uh, she is also in the uh, media, the, the, the Greek tragedy of Euripides, and uh, Circe, of course, Circe is most famous for her appearance in the uh, Odyssey of, of Homer. Now, these two ladies are also related, because uh, Medea is supposed to be the niece of Circe, and Circe being the daughter of the goddess Hecate. And here we see the first appearance and the first strong connection between uh, this kind of tradition, this kind of um, quote-unquote witchcraft and the goddess Hecate. Another very strong connection is related to the land of where these two ladies come from, which is the Thessaly, which is region on the northwest of, uh, sorry, north uh, east of Greece. And um, Thessaly uh, historically was known for a magical tradition, um, known to have these, these witches able to uh, quote unquote draw down the moon. Uh, I think we heard this, this kind of ritual, we heard this kind of words nowadays. Uh, originally, the ritual of drawing down the moon comes from Thessaly, comes from this lady, and it was supposed to be related on how this lady were able to manipulate uh, or to use uh, the phases of the moon or the eclipses of the moon for magical purposes. So here we see this connection between uh, Circe Media, so the Pharmakeia, the goddess Hecate is supposed to be the uh, mother of, of Circe, and everything moving and developing from this region called uh, Thessaly. So now we move a little bit forward to uh, the situation in Europe before the Roman Empire, so pre-Christian situation, and the influences that we have is from the south, of course, we have the Greek pantheon, which has already had a lot of syncretism with the Egyptian uh, pantheon. From the north, of course, we have the Norse, the Norse pantheon. Uh, so we're talking about Odin, we're talking about Thor, so we're talking about Freya. And then from the north uh, western side of, of Europe, we have the Celtic tradition and uh, with the Druids. So this is kind of very heterogeneous, but still a very pagan situation in Europe until, of course, um, the Roman Empire uh, to cover most of the uh, region around the Mediterranean Sea and uh, declare Christianity as the main religion of, of the empire. This is just to understand uh, the situation and um, this introduction is basically to take us to uh, the Middle Age when already uh, the situation of Christendom is well developed, is well established, and despite the fall of the Roman Empire, the Church is really trying hard to maintain and assert its power in the region, in the uh, region previously 
uh, part of the uh, Roman Empire. So uh, in order to maintain this kind of power, um, the church start to have, start to declare war to several kind of um, quote-unquote enemies. And the main enemies or the main uh, heretics that uh, the church declared were, uh, I would say, mainly in four groups. Uh, the, fir the first group are were Gnostic, Gnostic groups, so uh, not necessarily uh, with different thinking from Christianity, but just with a different interpretation of the scriptures. And among this group, I, for instance, we have the Cathars, we have the uh, Waldensians, so all this group that the church declared heretic. Uh, another group that we have are, are the, of course, the surviving uh, pagan cults, we have surviving um, worshipping of um, pre-Christian gods and as long as we have um, we also have what we would say the um, village healers or the, the, the wise women, wise men a um, little bit different from the cunning folk but mainly uh, this lady or man they could operate with within or without a religious a context but still they were the one used in the village to uh, to heal or, or where people were going instead of a doctor or for the uh, agrarian um, for agrarian rural kind of um, problems for daily and, and practically practical remedies another group that uh, the church was really uh, against were the strong and powerful women and I think the biggest example that we have in, in history is Joan of Arc, of Arc that again was um, declared heretic, was declared a witch and burned at the stake. So the question I mean, at this point is if there actually was a, a witchcraft cult or a witchcraft religion uh, in Europe in the pre-Christian time. And this is a very hard question to answer um, because first of all the uh, scholars and academic really only recently took interest in this uh, question and only recently they started to uh, dig into archaeology archaeologically and anthropologically speaking try to dig into whether there is a continuity in this kind of, of tradition and another reason is because uh, these practices were mainly carried on by um, oral tradition. We're talking about people that are mainly illiterate, so we don't have uh, much of uh, writing, we don't have much of documents to be able to actually study if there was something, um, some kind of common uh, belief uh, related to witchcraft before the Christian period. Now we are propelled into uh, the um, Middle Age, full Middle Age, and um, we still, at this point, we do not have uh, in Latin a word for uh, witch yet. I mean, Latin didn't have and don't have a word for, for witch. The closest that we could get to Pharmacaea was Maleficus, and Maleficus uh, is somebody that is doing something evil, is an evil doer, and Maleficium is um, the use of super supernatural power to cause injuries. So, uh, this is just a general broad stroke of what we are talking about, nothing referred in specific to a uh, witch. And is until late 1400, where uh, the, the Catholic clergyman Kramer published uh, the Malleus Maleficarum. So here you can see from Malefica, the uh, Pharmacia, the, the witch, Maleficarum, so the hammer of, of witches. The hammer of witches, this, this text that is like a, like a misogynist rant, um, completely out of this world, and it, it, it just put together most likely things coming from um, ancient pagan rites. Um, they mixed up a lot of things and um, describing what a witch is, uh, describing the orgies with uh, the devil, uh, 
uh, describing the devil itself. Uh, but um, what is the most interesting part of this this book that um, it was really um, talking about um, cult, saying that and these witches have an agenda, and the agenda is to uh, destroy Christendom uh, and to let evil take over the world, the evil being represented by the devil. And the witches were her um, army. So the whole story is about instilling this kind of fear that there was actually like an organized mob, uh, the witches themselves, uh, at the service of Satan and Satan with the agenda of taking over the world. And here we have the uh, typical stereotyped image of the witch flying on the broom. Actually, flying on the broom comes from the Waldensians, um, from one of the books related to the Waldensians. But we have the witch like eating the babies, uh, having like all this orgiastic, the Sabbath. Even the word Sabbath, if you notice, is, is a word that is connected to uh, the... Uh, Judaic tradition. So as ridiculous as it seems, actually the Malleus Maleficarum was the uh, second most uh, sold book for over two centuries after the, the Bible in, in Europe. And it was also the book that shaped uh, the uh, image of the witch as we uh, know it today. And of course, we all well know the disaster that uh, this book made uh, with starting the witch hunt and all the people that were persecuted and, and, and executed um, in Europe and in the New World, in the United States. Moving forward, uh, we arrive to the uh, Renaissance. In the Renaissance, where there is the rediscovery of uh, classic, classical things. Uh, there is the rediscovery of books coming from the uh, Middle East. And uh, there is the introduction of the hermetic uh, tradition, both on the philosophical hermetic, like the Corpus Hermeticum that was translated from Ficino in, in Latin. And we have the technical hermetics, so like the uh, magic coming from the Persian, Egyptian, um, and alchemy, astrology. And together with the uh, Hermetics, we also have the um, translation of, of grimoires. We have some grimoires that were translated from uh, mainly Arabic language into Latin. So here is the time of the Picatrix, is the time of the Solomonic related tradition, uh, a lot of planetary magic coming into. So we, we basically have the situation in Europe where we have folk magic mixing up with um, new tradition that they were like uh, injected into from the Renaissance period. And the problem that the church was facing at this time is because we have people like Ficino, we have people like Pico, we have, um, of course, we have Giordano Bruno. We have other people that are really trying to uh, bring into Christianity some kind of ancient um, philosophy, ancient teaching coming from uh, Hermes Magistus and, and other grimoires, and the church trying to understand where to draw the line, where was, where is actually natural magic, where is uh, the uh, positive use of magic, where is the perennial philosophy, where we are talking about philosophy, when we are talking about uh, demonology or using magic for uh, evil purposes. And as we know, within the context of a uh, religion, um, like say within Christianity, if I can, if I heal somebody, if I'm a priest and I heal somebody, we call it a miracle and we call it under the influence of God. If I am not a Christian and I heal somebody, this must be the uh, work of the devil. This was basically the concept, but still the church is having a really hard time to define um, and to draw lines between uh, natural magic and, and, and evil magic. Finally, then we move into our modern period, so late 1800, early 1900, and uh, where all this new learned magic start to be part of what will be defined as quote-unquote high magic. Um, high magic is a term that actually was um, given by uh, Eliphas uh, Levy, 
blending mysticism with, with magic. I'm going to read a sentence that actually comes from uh, Professor Ronald Hutton in his book, The Triumph of the Moon, because I think this sentence is, is really um, good to understand the difference between high magic and low magic. So high magic is a term coming from Le uh, Levy, blending mysticism with magic, while low magic used to denote all those practices that fell within the broad category of magic and they were not part of their self-consciously learned tradition. In particular, such activities belong to the world of popular belief and custom, concerned not with the mystery of the universe and the empowerment of the magus, so much as with the practical remedies for specific problems. So here, uh, Levy starts to uh, give this new definition of high magic. So high magic is everything related to mysticism, is using magic to, uh, he borrows a lot from, from Neoplatonism, is magic in order to evolve as, as, a, as a person, as a spiritual, to evolve spiritually, while all the rest is more related to practical daily remedies. And that would be in the category of um, folk magic or law magic, which identifies uh, the um, village, the cunning folk, uh, so the village healers, the, the, the wise men, the wise women, that at this point, not only they have the baggage from uh, the pre-Christian uh, folk tradition, but they also start to merge with the new information from the uh, astrological books from, from uh, the Arabic tradition. They start to blend in some more astrology. They, they start to learn more about the grimoires. So in the cunning man uh, writing of this period, we really see a lot of blending of very ancient um, tradition, newer tradition coming in from the Renaissance, and also some kind of um, invocation that changed in order to survive through Christianity. So most likely most of the invocation or spells for, for daily use, maybe they were addressed to some other kind of divinity, but became now uh, read as invocation to Jesus Christ, the Trinity, or other kind of saints. And this, of course, was a change necessary in order to survive throughout uh, Christianity. So we go back to our question again. So was there a pre-Christian organized witch cult in Europe? I'm not talking about the witch cult that was depicted in the Malus Maleficarum, but a real uh, pagan uh, cult that actually we can identify as a, as a witchcraft cult. Well, this study was first picked up by a lady called Margaret Murray. Um, she was she lived between 1863 and the 1963, and she produced a couple of books related to the subject. Uh, she was um, an anthropologist and archaeologist, um, and she published a couple of books related to the subject. Uh, uh, one of them is called The Witch Cult in Western Europe. So Margaret Murray really tried to dig into this um, question and did, she did come up with some um, theories that there actually was a common pre-Christian witch cult in Europe uh, but unfortunately her uh, research were late, later debunked but she was not trying to uh, cheat anyone but unfortunately the, uh, the material, the research of the material and the results that, that she produced uh, was really, is, is not really practically acceptable. So uh, the question remained, although uh, the work of Margaret Murray still very important and uh, definitely was very important for uh, Gerald Gardner, the uh, founder of, of Wicca. Gerald Gardner really took a lot from uh, Margaret Murray's work as much as he took several things from Alistair Crowley. In fact, uh, Gerald Garden was uh, in the OTO, in the Ordo Templi Orientis of um, Alistair Crowley, and he was pretty up there in the organization to the point that when Alistair, Alistair Crowley passed away, uh, Gerald Garden was supposed to uh, become the uh, new leader of the OTO organization, but he decided to go on his own uh, way, he was not really much interested in that. 
um, crawly kind of approach to magic, but he really wanted to promote his, his witchcraft, his folk tradition. Uh, so he took his own way. So between the uh, work of Alistair Crowley, the work of uh, Margaret Murray, um, other sources for sure, uh, Gerald Gardner introduced the uh, unofficial witchcraft uh, religion, uh, Wicca, as, as we all know today. Um, and I think it was officially in the 1950, if I'm not wrong, also because um, the, the, in, uh, in Britain there was the Witchcraft Act, uh, which was in, still in place, and it was removed or repealed in 1951, and that's where I think Gerald Gardner and Wicca could officially move a little bit more freely in the both in the Brit, uh, British and international um, international scene. Pretty much at the same time, we also have um, the book from Charles uh, Leland, uh, the famous cult uh, Aradia, the, the the cult of Diana. And this book is supposed to be a research that Leland did in in Italy uh, through the help of this lady called Maddalena. Uh, Maddalena supposedly she uh, tried to gather, uh, put together an oral tradition between the Emilia Romagna region and the Tuscany region uh, about this cult of, of, of um, Aradia. Aradia is, is a cult that is uh, mainly coming from the goddess Diane, Diana. Aradia is supposed to be the daughter of, of Diana. And um, Aradia could also be related to um, the uh, Queen Herodias. Nevertheless, whether these sources are uh, actually reliable or, or not, Leland published this book, and this book also had a very strong influence in the um, creation of what we call the Stregeria or the La, La Vecchia Religione in, in, in Italian. And now, finally, we moved on what are the main difference, what are the common things and the difference between the northern uh, witchcraft, uh, the northern European witchcraft and the southern uh, European witchcraft. So the common points, I think, the common traits that we have is, is it's, we're talking about the cult toward the mother goddess, mainly related to agrarian cycles so seasonal cycles um, we found common use of uh, knots uh, nails uh, candles representing people so figurines made out of, of wax uh, the use of moon cycle and the use of menstrual blood um, the uh, two laws are very common laws like one is the sympathetic and one is the law of contagion being sympathetic so everything connect to everything else so acting on something you produce an effect on something else and the law of contagion that um, things keep surviving keep 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 having the energy of something even after like for instance hairs like nails uh, clothes would keep carrying the energy of the person even when these are not in contact with the body anymore and this can be used to affect actually the the person that was carrying them um, we have the same influence from the grimoires from the later grimoires and from the hermetic studies we have pretty much a similar evolution also because the sources were exactly uh, the same we have a very strong shamanic approach in order to, for living in harmony with nature and, and the seasons and uh, also another very common thing is that these practices were mainly inherited or taught person to person but they were not learned they were not taught so they were like really there was some kind of family tradition to it so this in terms of common uh, traits um, in terms of the most of like the, the the difference so we talk about if we look into the northern which kind of culture that which is was a stronger influence from the Celtic Norse and Druid tradition, we found we find the famous Wheel of the Year that now is currently uh, used in in Wiccan and in and in other pagan uh, neo pagan traditions. We have a specific of the northern tradition the the triple goddess and the horned god. Um, which could be referred to Serunos, which is one of the gods in the um, Celtic pantheon. 
we have the use of familiars and uh, the use of familiars is very specific to the uh, British tradition. We don't have much use of familiars like an animal that actually is, is it's, it's like a familiar uh, in the southern tradition, but this is common in the northern one. And other common in the northern one is the, like the witch bottles, uh, the witch cakes. So a lot of use of like urines, for example, for like protection, like which bottle was mainly uh, filled with urines and, and, and nails and other things as much as the witch cake was baked with, with the urine of the witch for um, protection. While uh, talking about the Southern tradition, uh, instead of the wheel of the ear, um, that is more um, is more related to the uh, pagan festivity coming from the Roman time or the Greek time. Like for instance, we have the Nemoralia, which is a um, festivity dedicated to the, uh, Diana, to Diana. And uh, Hecate, um, there is the, uh, the festivity of Pomona, the goddess of Apo. Um, we have the Saturnalia in, in December. So the, the witchcraft calendar in the Southern tradition revolves more around um, Roman pre-Christian pagan uh, festivities. And another thing that is in the South is pretty common is a cult of what is called um, Bona Domina. Bona, bona Domina um, in Latin means like a good lady. And this good lady, depending on the region, especially in Italy, depending on the region, this Bona, uh, bona Domina could be identified with uh, Diana, Hecate, or uh, Herodias, like, like the Aradia, or Isis, coming from the um, Egyptian, Isis and Osiris, coming from the Egyptian tradition. Another very strong thing of the southern one is the evil eye, evil eye just coming from Persian, Egyptian, still very much strong uh, nowadays in Italy, especially in the southern of Italy, evil eyes is really a, a big thing. And um, another interesting part is the bells, the bells used as a symbol of, of fertility. So these are typical of the, of the southern part. And yeah, this is pretty much it. Today was just a very, we had a lot of things, to, a lot of topics to cover, but also don't want to make the discussion too uh, heavy and too details. So this is pretty much it for, for today. I just few recommendations if you want to uh, get deeper into this very fascinating, very interesting study. I totally recommend the books from uh, Professor Ronald Hutton, uh, The Witch and The Triumph of the Moon. Really wonderful uh, book. Uh, books and then we have but who can read uh, who can read Italian with the Stregoneria in Italia by Andrea Romanazzi. Romanazzi is another researcher in the Italian witchcraft tradition. Um, and another very nice book is Witchcraft, the Library of Esoterica by Jessica Handley and uh, Pam Gossman. Uh, so this book are there is many others, but definitely these are the uh, recommended one if you want to have a look at the both the anthropological historical uh, part of the evolution of witchcraft. And that's about it for today. Again, thanks for staying with me and see you soon. Bye.